Hello, my name is Aria and I'm a second year PhD student at Montana State University at Dr. Boy Lab and I'm going to be talking about probing the relationship between fluid mixing, biodiversity and productivity in Yellowstone Hot Springs. To talk about that, we need to first visit early earth and early life meta metabolic pathways. So in all the oldest evidence for life in lands in a hydrothermal environment dating back to 3.5 years ago. Over here, I'm bringing a timeline of Earth history with, four, uh, with the time in billions of years on the y-axis, and then oxygen concentrations on the x-axis here. And I've highlighted the period of the time of only Earth that we think uh, increased volcanic activity was happening. And that is important because volcanoes are speeding chemical forms of energy that microbes can use for their metabolic pathways. So I know that on early Earth, this life was very likely based on chemosynthesis. And that's also true for the primary production, since that was the, uh, the likely pathway happening. So we know that uh, since the beginning of Earth history, life was uh, chemosynthetic. And of course, that changed when life figured out how to use sunlight to then be able to do photosynthesis. And that um, changed our surface and atmosphere a lot. However, what I really want to point out here is that chemosynthesis was happening since the beginning and is still happening until this day. So, of course, photosynthesis has taken over a lot of um, this primary production um, responsibility. However, we can still find environments to study chemosynthetic uh, primary productivity that is not only on the deep sea or on dark environments. So we kind of can travel back in time when we visit hot springs. Modern hot springs can be seen as this model that allows us for investigating this chemosynthetic base productivity in the absence of photosynthesis. Because in hot springs, we have a, a inhibition of photosynthesis based on pH, we can see here on the y-axis, on the end temperature, we can see here on the on the x-axis. So on the with the white square, squares, we see that this uh, photosynthesis genes are absent, which means that this primary productivity uh, in this environment here is based on chemosynthesis. So when we go to a hot spring, we can, we can kind of travel back in time as we increase in temperature and decrease in pH. Uh, so we know that, for example, in, in some really hot, hot springs pools, this primary productivity is based on chemosynthesis. So why is that important? Well, in macroecology, biodiversity and productivity relationships has been extensively studied. So we see that, for example, when tree species richness increase, the productivity there also increases in a positive relationship. Uh, in microbial ecology, however, all of this relationship has been probed in environments that are based on photosynthesis as well, uh, just like macroecology. So we see some different types of relationships that are not always positive relationships. We have other types of relationships that happen between biodiversity and productivity. Um, here, those measurements are generally based on um, this in, um, indirect measure of chlorophyll. Um, and we can then see that we have different relationships. However, there is a lack of research on biodiversity and productivity relationship that is solely based on chemosynthesis. Uh, so because of that, we might think, well, how can we approach that question? And what can help promote biodiversity for chemosynthetic um, environments? So we know uh, and we hypothesize that for chemosynthesis, since they are based on the availability of nutrients or different chemical energy sources present on the environment, we might hypothesize that more redox pairs, um, which means more nutrients, will mean more niche space, which might support a higher biodiversity. So a quick way to see this uh, in bringing already the idea of hot springs here is that, for example, in a hot spring one where we have three different uh, redox pairs and is a reduced environment where there is no oxygen present. If we have three different uh, niche spaces here, we might support three different species in a very simple way to show this.
In opposite idea, if we have an oxidized spring where we can have two different niche spaces here, we might support two species. However, if you mix these two environments, so if you have a hot spring that is mixed, we will have a, a higher uh, range of niche spaces which might support more species, which will mean that that's increased biodiversity, which might promote primary production. So I hypothesized that in Yellowstone National Park hot springs, the increased fluid mixing sourcing those waters might increase the availability of nutrients, which means more redox pairs. That would increase then uh, biodiversity and that would then increase primary productivity. So Yellowstone National Park uh, hosts the largest hydrothermal system on Earth. It's also very close to us here in Montana, which makes it a very suitable uh, environment to research on. It has more than 10,000 geothermal features and they have a wide range of geochemistry, which allow us to uh, really understand how this environment might be uh, promoting biodiversity. So Yellowstone National Park has a really interest way of the pH distribution. It is a bimodal distribution uh, that is based on the subsurface processes happening there that I'm not going to have time to explain. But what's important here to see is that uh, hot springs in Yellowstone have this bimodal pH of acidic of less um, pH less than 4 and we have high sulfate and low chloride ratios on those hot springs. And we also have more neutral to alkaline hot springs uh, higher than 6 which uh, have more uh, more chloride than sulfate. So we can use sulfate and chloride ratios to aid in understanding the water sourcing and fluid mixing patterns of hot springs. Another way to visualize this is spotting that in a, in a uh, sulfate chloride ratio. So you can see here that low sulfate, low chloride means that these waters come from rainfall and snow melt. And then we see when you have higher chloride uh, and kind of medium sulfate here, those come from the aquifer, some of the deep hydrothermal uh, aquifer uh, of Yellowstone. And of course, you can have gas input there, which is going to increase that sulfate. And then we also have a lot of mixing happen in, um, in between all of these uh, end members over here. So we see that mixing is quite important in Yellowstone hot springs. And so I went to then um, through my objectives with this uh, hypothesis, which was characterizing the fluid mixing regime of selected hot springs, uh, characterizing the microbial community biodiversity, and quantifying the microbial community primary productivity. I'm not going to have time to give you the methods, but um, we can have questions being answered uh, by email later on. So we chose hot springs um, that is called the roadside. Uh, this is a model system already characterized by Lindsay et al. And they are a model system because they have this two bi this bimodal distribution of hot springs, uh, with roadside west being a hydrothermal only with pH more than 6, um, temperature is around 70. And we have roadside east, which is a city hot spring with uh, increased uh, temperature. However, we have this third hot spring that hasn't been fully characterized, and its name is roadside north. You can see that the temperatures is also very hot, but the pH is at 5.1, which falls outside of our bimodal distribution. So I just put an interrogation point there because we don't fully know how it's um, being influenced by the which type of mixing regime. So that was my first objective, and I'm just going to bring you here that plot of sulfate and chloride again, and plot my hot springs in here so we can understand the water sourcing. So we see that roadside west, uh, the triangle here, indeed is a hydrothermal only water sourcing, uh, high chloride, low sulfate ratios. Roadside east, it is a meteoric plus gas influenced hot spring with low, with high sulfate and low chloride. And then we see roadside north actually falls really close to roadside east, which doesn't fully make sense since the pH is quite different at 5.1. So when we look at the gas, um, the soft gas quantification in these hot springs, we then start to understand a little bit more. So on the y-axis we have uh, methane, hydrogen, and, and um, CO2, and on the y-axis we have our hot springs. We see that roadside west and roadside east, um, they have you know this low range of gas, which is normal for most of the springs in Yellowstone. But when we see roadside north, that is very striking that roadside north receives a lot of gas. So we call this hot spring uh, meteoric, uh, meteoric plus gas, uh, 
plus um, more gas being uh, input in this hot spring. So a lot of gas. And that makes sense when we visit our map again and I show you that there is a trimmer roll right across uh, roll side north. So that means that roll side north is in this line of this gas input uh, and then this pH is likely being buffered by the CO2 bicarbonate uh, system. And then we can then uh, conclude that roll side north is the result of extensive fluid mixing when in comparison to the other two hot springs. So how does that affect the biodiversity? We can see here that our metagenome assembled genomes relative abundance really show a difference as well. So when we see roll side west, um, planktonic and sediment communities, we have um, only a few species here uh, with one species being more dominant and those are all bacteria. When we look at roll side east, uh, we could only have DNA for the planktonic community and not sediment, but we see the same trend where one, one species is more dominant. And then when we see, and then it's archaea based. When we see roll side north, both planktonic and sediment communities are more evenly distributed uh, bonuses and they have a mix of bacteria and archaea. So that means that when we uh, look at more in detail statistic analysis of diversity, such as symptom index, we see that roll side north has more um, biodiversity. When we look at the genomic diversity, we did the uh, analysis called non parallel diversity, and we see that roll side north um, it is again more diverse. So uh, we see here that this is a whole metagenomic analysis, so not just the genomes that were assembled into MAX. And this gives you a full picture of the metagenome and shows us that a uh, cyanor is more diverse. When we then see the primary productivity uh, using uh, 14C bicarbonate label um, assays, we also see the same thing. So primary productivity is higher in side north than side. Uh, west and east for both planktonic and sediment communities. So in conclusion, I saw that rural side north is more, uh, has more fluid mixing. It is also more taxonomic and more uh, genomic diverse. And that means uh, that the primary produ productivity there is also higher than the other two hot springs. Here are some future work where I need to finalize functional diversity analysis and maybe test my hypothesis in a larger sample size while holding the temperature constant since that could have some influence. Here are some acknowledgements and thank you for listening.